So, assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Welcome to the 10th session of the third Neuro Oncology Symposium. The title of this session is Precision Neuro Oncology. For those who just joined, I am Izzah Tahir, medical student at the Aachen University and part of the student organizing committee for three ANOS. I will be introducing the chair and co-chair for this session, Dr. Reed Thompson and Dr. Adiba Zaki. Dr. Thompson is the William F. Meacham Professor of Neurological Surgery, Chairman of the Department of Neurological Surgery, and Director of Neurosurgical Oncology at Vanderbilt Medical Center. He also holds a secondary appointment as Professor of Otolaryngology at Vanderbilt Medical Center. He serves on the Joint Section of Cerebrovascular Surgery for the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Welcome, Dr. Thompson. The co-chair of this session is Dr. Adiba Zaki. She is a medical oncologist and senior instructor in the Department of Oncology at the Aachen University. She is a graduate of the Dow University, and she completed her training in medical oncology from AKU in 2020. Her interest lies in adult neuro-oncology. I would like to welcome both on the stage. Great, thank you so much. All right, well, we have a great panel of uh, four fabulous speakers. Um, hope, hoping that everyone will mind the time so we can get to some robust questions. They've been so great today. Uh, first, uh, as of our panelists uh, this afternoon is Dr. Rahil Ahmed, who is a pediatric neurosurgeon at the Department of uh, Neurological Surgery at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He graduated from AKU and did his neurosurgery residency in the very cold state of Iowa, followed by fellowship training in the Netherlands. And then he pursued a very rigorous, robust uh, pediatric neurosurgery fellowship at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And I might add, that's the foremost nurse, uh, pediatric neurosurgery training uh, program in the world, in my opinion. Uh, Dr. Ahmed specializes in pediatric and congenital neurosurgery really all aspects of pediatric neurosurgery, especially epilepsy, brain tumors, and craniofacial disorders, Chiari malformations, craniocervical anomalies. And his research focuses on the surgical management of epilepsy and pediatric congenital spinal disorders. He's the director of pediatric neurosurgical epilepsy there, and he closely collaborates with colleagues in pediatric neurology, neuropsychology, neuroradiology to evaluate and treat all aspects of epilepsy in children. And we're really looking forward to your talk today. Thank you so much. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, good afternoon and a very early good morning from here in Wisconsin. Um, thank you, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Adiba Kazi for the very kind remarks. Um, I am going to share my screen here. And uh, that should come up in presentation format. Um, I, uh, my, my neurosurgical practice uh, focuses on taking care of children here at the University of Wisconsin. I don't have any uh, financial disclosures. The one professional disclosure that I do have, um, as was briefly mentioned, uh, is the fact that many, many years ago, I, my journey started at AKU where I was a medical student. So it's truly an honor and privilege to be participating today in this symposium. And I want to particularly thank uh, the scientific committee um, in general, and also Dr. Ather Nam and Dr. Noreen Mushtaq for their very kind invitation and the opportunity to participate. Uh, I'm going to start by slowly pivoting the conversation away from the so-called so standard ontological perspective, which is uh, observation in a few cases, but usually lesion-directed surgery, adjuvant therapies, and start talking about seizure control. It's an important treatment paradigm because in patients who present with tumors and epilepsy, Achieving seizure freedom is as important as achieving tumor control. Achieving one without the other doesn't help you attain full quality of life measures in, in your patient. So therefore, it stands to reason that it is both ontological prognosis and seizure control 
that must be addressed as such in the overall management of patients who have brain tumor related um, epilepsy. Um, for the general interest of students and, and, and residents in the audience, it's a common problem. Um, most often seizures can be a presenting symptom. If it doesn't uh, present at onset, it usually presents at some later point in the disease course with an overall incidence of somewhere around uh, up to 70%. Most commonly, these are low-grade gliomas, and particularly so in a subset, in a particular histological subset of glioneural tumors that a very high predisposition towards developing a medication refractory state where um, essentially medications are ineffective in helping achieve um, tumor, uh, excuse me, seizure control. Uh, why does this happen? Very briefly, there are two canonical uh, basic pathways of um, uh, creating this uh, state of pathogenesis. The first is a metabolic disturbance in the pre-tumoral environment. We know that there's destruction of the blood vein barrier, there's usually up or down regulation of aquaporins and other transmembrane water conducting channels that leads to local edema, that leads to local injury. The rapid tumor growth causes ischemia, hypoxia, and a whole inflammatory cascade that then triggers an excitotoxic reaction in the immediate environment of the tumor. At the level of the overall neuronal network, we know that there is a higher extracellular glutamate concentration within and around tumors, which therefore obviously predisposes uh, towards excitotoxicity. And conversely, that higher glutamate concentration can then shut down some of the transmembrane chloride channels, which are essential for the GABA-induced neuroinhibition. So it's this imbalance between excitotoxicity and inhibition that overall predisposes towards a higher epileptogenic potential than then pushes the network towards um, creating an epileptiform disorder. We are now also know that there are certain histological subtypes, most commonly in, in, in adults like the um, IDH um, uh, molecular marker that also predisposes towards uh, seizures by the same mechanism. So why is it a problem? It's a cumulative problem. It adds up over time. There's a higher incidence of progression to a medication refractory state. Drugs don't work. When they do work, they have side effects. There's a very uh, well-defined phenomenon of secondary neurocognitive dysfunction that happens as a result of ongoing seizures. It's bad for the patient, bad for caregivers, and all of this translates into a huge healthcare burden and therefore uh, must be addressed as such. So the few treatment paradigms that I want to touch on are situations when a lesionectomy is not enough situations when you need to think about invasive monitoring and think beyond sort of the traditional oncological control. Um, some of the basic principles involved in maximizing and ensuring a good seizure control outcome that can be done in a safe manner using neurophysiological adjuncts or imaging adjuncts. And in the end, briefly, if I have time, I'd like to talk about um, pathway-directed therapies using tuberous sclerosis as an illustrative example. So uh, instances when uh, a lesionectomy is not enough is most commonly personified by these so-called mesial temporal tumors. These are most commonly glioneural tumors, um, most usually gangliogliomas or dysembryoblastic neuroepithelial tumor. Very characteristically, they originate within um, the uncle region. They involve the entorhinal cortex, involve the amygdala, may or may not extend into the hippocampal and the parahippocampal regions. And if they're really large and fairly extensive, they can also extend out into the lateral neocortical regions. Interestingly, because they have both a neuronal and a glial component, they actually in themselves have an intrinsic epileptogenic uh, potential, which obviously predisposes towards a seizure state. And then there's this well-described uh, phenomenon of double trouble or tandem lesions, as we call it, where you have dyslamination defects, migrational defects, and dysplasia that occur in tandem in association with the neoplastic lesion that then therefore predisposes towards a much larger epileptogenic network that grows above and beyond the radiographic lesion that we, that we uh, can see on the initial MR studies. So how do you actually extend the lesionectomy and address this uh, resection to encompass and include and obviously and hopefully successfully remove the epileptogenic zone and help achieve seizure freedom? 
Uh, this is an illustrative uh, case from uh, someone that I helped take care of earlier. A young child presents with uh, new onset uh, complex partial seizures. Scalp EEG shows uh, the temporal onset. The MR studies again show, as I mentioned, a very characteristic mesially temporal uh, located uh, lesion that is until proven otherwise, most probably a low grade. Uh, glioma, astrocytoma, perhaps, or more commonly a ganglion glioma or a DNET. Interestingly, um, on the on the right foremost um, uh, coronal view, the hippocampal appears to be normal. So you have the situation where the scalp EEG and the semiology indicates temporal onset. You have clear radiographic involvement of uh, the amygdala and the uncus, which certainly has to go along with the temporal pole. But what do you do about the rest of the temporal lobe? Do you remove it, not remove it, uh, and how do you address it? This is a young child. You need to be fairly aggressive in terms of achieving seizure freedom, or he will certainly never um, do well in the long term. And the fact that usually in young children, language lateralization doesn't occur until slightly later, maybe um, following three years or slightly older, it's probably implausible to suggest that you could be more aggressive despite the fact that this is presumably his dominant temporal lobe. So we advocated for a complete uh, anterior temporal lobectomy, the hippocampy, excuse me, the hippocampectomy extended all the way uh, posteriorly to the tectal plate, removed the superior temporal gyrus, completed the temporal resection all the way up to the height of the, uh, of the temporal stem. And interestingly, um, uh, I'll move this side here. Interestingly, this hippocampal head that we isolated did end up indicating uh, on histological uh, analysis um, evidence of ganglioglioma involvement. So had we not removed this hippocampal lesion and left behind what now we know uh, retrospectively as tumor involvement, this would certainly would have been a treatment failure. So this is a nice example of when you have electrographic evidence and clinical evidence to suggest a larger area of involvement, perhaps a more aggressive resection that extends beyond the radiographic lesion is well warranted. This is a similar but slightly different scenario. An older child uh, on the far left panel is his initial presentation to a different hospital several years earlier, where again he presented uh, with the semiology that uh, uh, most of us would recognize as fairly characteristic of uh, temporal onset. He had a resection by um, another neurosurgeon, initially did well, the pathology was indicative of a, of a grade two astrocytoma, but then fairly quickly relapsed and started having seizures again and presented more recently to, to our attention. And now if you look at the scans, you can, um, you can uh, possibly consider all these different uh, uh, differentials. This is residual tumor, this is recurrent tumor, uh, are some of these radiographic uh, changes that we see a function of the ongoing secondary epileptogenesis that's occurring. How big is the epileptogenic zone? And now, unlike the younger child, this is an older high school student doing quite well with the normal neurocognitive profile. So can you ad hoc empirically remove this dominant temporal lobe or not? So we, in this case, we advocated um, for phase two monitoring with uh, stereo EG coverage with what is a rather standard um, temporal template involves the anterior temporal lobe, the mesial structures, the lateral structures involves the temporal insula with the a priori supposition that if we find mesial onset, we could offer a selective uh, hippocampectomy or laser ablation, or if it's a much wider zone of involvement, then we would, um, then we would uh, recommend a, um, a, a wider sort of traditional surgical resection. So following a stereo EG, interestingly, all these areas that we see as radiographically abnormal and also radiographically normal turned out to be all involved. So it was the anterior temporal lobe, it was the better part of the lateral neocortical uh, tissue, it was amygdala, it was hippocampus, and, and, and um, now that we have this electrographic evidence, which is probably as good as it gets in terms of defining the extent of the epileptogenic zone, we feel fairly confident in, in uh, recommending a uh, dominant resection. He probably still stands to uh, incur some risk or some detriment in his memory function, but again, he's 16 and not 76, so this is probably better to be done at an earlier stage uh, 
then to let it linger on and, and potentially translate into even a wider epineptogenic zone, which would be much more difficult to treat later on. So this principle has been outlined and recognized uh, by, by many others with the supposition that often beyond the lesion, hippocampal or adjacent mesial temporal regions are often epileptogenic, um, even if the MR indication uh, or even if the MR does not indicate as much. And therefore, it stands to reason that doing a much larger resection tends to have a much better rate of seizure freedom. And in an extended lesionectomy, excuse me, an extended resection offers a higher odds of achieving seizure freedom than a strict lesionectomy, which is only targeting uh, the radiographic lesion. So this therefore behooves the principle that uh, you need to be guided by pre-surgical neurophysiological data, history, semiology, scalp data, and sometimes even phase two monitoring to help truly identify how big the epileptogenic zone is. The principle is that the resection needs to be maximized. Consider a lesionectomy uh, plus approach as, as, I, as I reviewed. Be absolutely cognizant of the fact that you could have changes outside the radiographic lesion. So carefully look for changes within uh, the temporal lobe. It could be either primary as a result of the tumor or could be secondary if there's long uh, standing epilepsy and now you've got a much wider network. And if you have a failure following a lesionectomy, then the most probable reason is this uh, idea of having dual pathology, which is uh, residual leftover gliosis, dysplasia, or hippocampal sclerosis, which is, which is bound to cause a treatment failure until, uh, until it is specifically addressed. The other treatment paradigm that I'll talk about is the so-called indeterminate lesion. So when the differential diagnosis is too broad, when the electroclinical data does not match up with the imaging data, and, and or when you suspect there's an epileptogenic lesion, but it's too ill-defined. So, 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 so how do you actually how, how do you actually draw and map out your resection margins to to uh, to, to help achieve seizure freedom? Again, this is an illustrative example of a young child that we took care of. He's left-handed, but interestingly, is still left-sided dominant, and it is and has a semiology that's quite characteristic of uh, where this lesion is located. It's not enhancing. It's within the superficial cortical ribbon. Has this odd vacuolated appearance that is probably again synonymous with uh, a DNet or a ganglioglioma or potentially an astrocytoma. He does have speech arrest as, um, as uh, a component of the semiology, so we obviously need to be cognizant of overlap uh, and or at least proximity to his presumed broker's area, which is evidence as such when we reconstruct his uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus, and you can very nicely see broker's area right anterior uh, to where the lesion is, which, which ties in well with the semiology. Um, this is a slightly older case. Uh, back then, we were still doing subdural grids. I think now if I had to address it, I would probably do it with stereo EG. This is an interoperative uh, pictorial representation where we can identify and map using navigation where the lesion is, use uh, standard phase reversal and other neurophysiological tools to identify where the central sulcus is, uh, where the motor area is, then you can corroborate that with bedside testing once the grid goes in place. And then we ended up placing this grid, which we, which we, which we used to collect uh, data of the subsequent days. So interestingly, uh, the predominant epileptogenic zone did indeed match up with the radiographic lesion, but oddly, he had a much wider uh, area of what we call as an uh, irritative zone where there are a lot of prominent after discharges. So then the question is, is this a primary phenomenon, which is to say that you have a much broader area, which uh, may likely cause breakthrough seizure if you don't address it? Or is it a secondary phenomenon just because it's in close proximity to the underlying primary lesion, which is causing this? So how do you address it, especially now that you're that now that you're trying to remove areas above and beyond what you see as radiographically abnormal, not to mention that it's in close proximity to eloquent hand and motor area. This is where ECOG really comes into play. We've used it, and as have uh, probably anyone else who's done similar cases, um, it works really well when at baseline you have abnormalities to compare things with. So this is um, at, the, at the second um, phase, so-called, uh, where you remove the grid and you, and you, and you complete a resection. Uh, 
where at baseline, we could corroborate these after discharges that extended above and beyond the radiographic lesion that was located more anteriorly. Uh, we used this one by four strip to, to, um, uh, to uh, use cortical nets during the case to help make sure that we are keeping the cortical spinal tract safe. And then interestingly, after resection of the primary area, when we repeated the ECOG, all these areas where we had mapped this wider irritative zone of prominent after discharges all disappeared. And you can very uh, nicely also put the grid deeper and in different aspects of the tumor resection and help ensure that you have nice, clean electrographic margins above and beyond the radiographic lesion. The child did really well, had a good satisfactory outcome, and it's, it's, it, 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 it's, an, it's a nice example where phase two monitoring was absolutely essential to rule out proximity and or overlap with motor speech, helps define the epileptogenic zone accurately, then also very importantly, helps to rule out the potential contribution of what was initially suspicious of a much wider irritative zone above and beyond the radiographic lesion. And uh, interestingly enough, the pathology actually turned out to be FCD with these characteristic features that are, that are the histopathological hallmark of uh, FCD type two. Um, but the management principle would have been very similar had this been a ganglioglioma or if it ever turned out to be um, a DNET or, or an astrocytoma for that matter. So uh, related to this is uh, another important concept, which is when someone with a low-grade tumor presents with new onset seizures and is otherwise neurologically intact, a seizure that are well-controlled on the first uh, anti-epileptic drug, what is the trigger to actually start definitive treatment? Do you, do you wait for the tumor to progress based on surveillance imaging? Do you wait for the emergence of a pharmacoresistant state, which is inevitably where the natural history will point to because we know that's how lesional epilepsy cases react. Um, this was addressed very nicely in this observational European study where they compared uh, patients who were treated either um, at centers that advocated upfront treatment versus centers that advocated this wait and see and act if you have problems, so as to say, approach, and showed a survival benefit for the former group, which advocates for, for early treatment. And this finding has very nicely been corroborated by many, many other studies, which show that seizure control outcomes corroborate positively with shorter symptom durations. So the earlier you act, the more likely you are to achieve seizure freedom, which is a bit of a dichotomy if you think of the fact that these are low-grade tumors, they're not progressing, they're otherwise asymptomatic, but for the benefit of achieving uh, seizure freedom, you have to be more proactive about it in uh, treating them on, on initial presentation. Another um, corollary to, to helping improve seizure uh, freedom uh, and achieve seizure freedom in, in tumoral epilepsy, which are uh, located in areas which are eloquent. So in, for example, perirolandic area where motor is at risk, um, you, can, you can use neurophysiological mapping. Uh, mapping uh, works really well. And I would humbly uh, contend that, at least in my experience, and again, it's been corroborated, corroborated excuse me, by others too, you don't necessarily have to have an awake surgery, especially in young children, to successfully map motor areas and keep them safe if you're operating in that area. And through a combination of cortical mapping, subcortical stimulation, and continuous MEPS uh, through cortical stimulation, you can, you can help achieve uh, safety as far as the cortical spinal tract is concerned. And then for speech function and visual radiation function, an example that I'll show shortly, you can use very nicely DTI fiber reconstruction then with the help of navigation, um, help achieve a, a, a safer section. So this is another young child we took care of who presents with focal seizures, but again, a very similar looking lesion superficially located within the cortical mantle. He has very early involvement of motor symptoms in his semiology, so that indicates at least proximity, if not overlap with, uh, with the motor strip, as is indicated also by the functional scan where these uh, colored blobs, so as to say, indicate that the motor strip is right behind um, the lesion. So uh, how do we do this? Well, um, we, again, uh, these are intraoperative uh, uh, 
pictorial uh, uh, samples where you know we can identify radiographically and map out the boundaries of the lesion. We can use phase reversal to very accurately identify where the motor strip is. You can use this one by four strip and a high frequency train of five stimulation protocol, as it's called and it's widely published. Where as long as you maintain map, it should be maps above fifty uh, percent. Uh, the patient should be safe in terms of avoiding a long term um, motor decrement. And, and, and safely operate in and around uh, the primary motor strip. And then uh, at the, uh, at the, in this case, the more posterior aspects or deeper aspects of resection where you come into proximity uh, with uh, the subcortical tissue and the corticospinal tracts, the subcortical stimulation works really well. Uh, as perhaps most of us already know, there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the threshold and the proximity and millimeters to the subcortical tract. So if you if you are stimulating, for example, at a threshold of two milliamps, you know you're just about two millimeters away uh, from the cortical spinal tract. And this is a nice illustrative proof of principle that indicates that this is exactly where we stop resection at the more posterior aspect of the tumor resection, where indeed the intraoperative uh, thresholds were about one to two millimeters, and it, it, it corroborates very uh, cleanly with the DTI reconstructions, and it's, it's just an internal sort of proof of principle to, to gain more confidence in your monitoring system. This has been well published and, 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 and well corroborated by, uh, by many groups and works really well. This child is doing extremely well at an online DNET and after a period of observation of about, I think, 12 or 15 months, uh, actually went off all his uh, AEDs. Um, very importantly, in patients who present uh, with seizures and an unlined tumor, seizure recurrence always equates with tumor recurrence. So instead of treating with medications, you always need to be cognizant that unless proven otherwise, there is tumor recurrence, which is responsible for breakthrough tumor. So this is a young girl, again, who was treated by someone else several years ago who presented with visual aura symptoms and has what appears to be, and I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the radiographic definition is, is, is not that obvious, but uh, take my word for it, there's this mesial uh, parietal lesion, uh, which was resected, it was a DNET, um, it was a growth growth resection as per uh, the neurosurgeon's assessment. And she later came to us with what appeared to be a repeat of the same seizure that she was having earlier. And now has this lesion again, is this scar tissue, is this uh, tumor regrowth? As I mentioned, we now need to address this as tumor recurrence until, until proven otherwise. Now, because she's neurologically intact and we know the visual radiation through, this, uh, through these reconstructions map right next to the tumor confined, there's probably no good reason to give her a deficit until you at least primarily approach it as a lesionectomy. And then maybe stage a much wider resection if she were to fail the lesionectomy. Again, the principle that it's tumor and not necessarily a wider epileptogenic network in this case that, uh, that, that, that needs to be addressed as such. So um, when she came to our attention, um, it was a rather straightforward uh, interhemispheric approach and she had a growth total resection. Again, did really well. The pathology showed a mixture of gliosis and the original path, which was um, which was the DNET, and she did really well uh, over the subsequent uh, couple of years and eventually went off her meds and is, is doing really well in terms of tumor control and obviously cured from the standpoint of procedure control. Uh, lastly, in the next few minutes, I'll very quickly talk about tuberous sclerosis. We don't always talk about tuberous sclerosis in the oncological perspective, unless, for example, we're talking about uh, subependimal giant cell astrocytomas, but I would probably uh, contend that Tuberous sclerosis very nicely um, expands the continuum from completely developmental lesions like dysplasia all the way to neoplastic lesions because they actually share the same mTOR uh, developmental signaling pathway. So this is a young child who presented with infantile spasms that are not very localizing and as is the usual case has several tubers that are outlined on the, on the, on the top panel. So how do you determine which one to take out? She's a young kid. You need to be sort of fairly aggressive till the disease um, gets progressive. And she underwent a steroid gene implantation, uh, which, which covered all these areas. And this um, pictorial graph of, 
the Shira EG array very nicely demonstrates that she actually had a very nice focal onset characterized by this uh, rhythmic burst of activity that then, then transitions into the spike wave pattern, which actually coincided with one single tuber. Um, and she should be an excellent candidate for a laser ablation, which she is due to have shortly. And will probably do well, at least for now, until unfortunately other tubers uh, act up and potentially cause her trouble. Uh, this is the molecular pathway that I mentioned earlier. This is shared between dysplasias and tuberous sclerosis and converges on the mTOR, which is why rapamycin was uh, originally recommended for treatment. And this very nice EXIST3 trial, uh, which is a multicentric trial, advocated for the use of Evrolimus because Evrolimus was one of those uh, uh, sort of uh, target pathway uh, inhibitors. Which, um, which could very successfully reduce the seizure frequency uh, burden, not just at initial treatment, but over time. And hopefully over time, instead of doing our big invasive surgeries, we uh, might potentially have these pathway inhibitors that can help uh, take care of uh, um, epilepsy in a much more focal and non-invasive manner. Uh, last but not the least, I would contend that surgery is still the primary therapeutic app, uh, option for tumor epilepsy. You need to very carefully consider surgical candidacy in terms of what the presumed pathology is, how well and how accurately you can identify what the epileptogenic zone is, how concordant your localization hypothesis is, and you're almost thinking of it as a true epileptogenic lesion rather than a tumor-associated epileptogenic lesion. And then use all the adjuncts, which all have their own in, 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 in terms of optimizing a safe, uh, complete resection. That's all I have, and I'd like to thank you all for your um, kind attention for this talk. Um, thank you, Dr. Rahil, for your wonderful talk. Uh, we'll take question answer session, question answer at the end of the session. I would like to introduce my next speaker, uh, Amin Habib. Amin Habib is an associate professor of neurology and neurotherapeutics in the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and a staff physician at North Texas Health Center. Dr. Habib's interest in the research involving investigation of growth factor signaling pathway in different cancer. His work has helped explain the interaction between the normal and mutant epidermal growth factor receptor in glioblastoma and identified interaction between the inflammatory and oncogenic signaling pathway in cancer. His recent work has been focused on the resistance to targeted treatment in cancer and therapeutic strategies to overcome resistance, especially in glioblastoma and lung cancer. Today, he will be discussing on the targeted EGFR signaling pathway for novel therapeutic in glioblastoma. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers of this conference uh, for this opportunity to share our work. Uh, I will start by sharing my screen and see if I can bring up my presentation. Yes. So um, as we all know, uh, glioblastoma is a devastating and uh, intractable disease uh, that uh, and treatment is uh, there's a great need for improvement. Um, but this is the initial uh, description of the genetic landscape of uh, glioblastoma uh, that came out in 2008. Uh, uh, and as you can see, uh, mutation and amplification of the EGFR uh, is a striking event in glioblastoma. Um, as I mentioned, uh, EGFR gene amplification and overexpression are common in glioblastoma, and you have increased expression of Y-type and mutant forms of the EGFR. The most common EGFR mutant is unable to bind ligand and signals constitutively. Uh, these changes are rare in low-grade astrocytoma. Uh, 
the topic of this presentation today primarily focuses on uh, invasion in GBM. As we know, GBMs are highly invasive tumors and there's infiltration of tumor cells beyond the visible margins of the tumor, rendering complete resection difficult and leading to recurrence. Before we talk further about invasion, uh, I wanna mention that uh, there are two types of EGFR signaling. There's constitutive signaling, and then there's ligand-induced ligand signaling or ligand-activated signaling. We are all familiar with the EGFR V3 mutant, which lacks the extracellular ligand binding domain and signals constitutively. Uh, EGFR Y type also, uh, when overexpressed, can signal constitutively in the absence of ligand. So, as I mentioned, EGFR V3 is the most common mutant found in GBM, it's constitutively active. There is evidence that the EGFR wild type also signals constitutively. And we would define constitutive signaling as signaling triggered by EGFR wild type or V3 expression, leading to spontaneous dimerization and downstream signaling in the absence of EGFR ligand. Uh, what we have found and published is that constitutive uh, and ligand activated. Uh, EGFR signaling triggered distinct uh, signaling pathways downstream. And now uh, we find that uh, this is also true for the biological outcome. So we start with a simple transwell invasion assay. Here we used a number of uh, uh, patient derived xenograft PDX lines generated at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, we looked at the effect of EGF on invasion in these lines. To our surprise, EGF suppressed invasion in all of these cell lines. And these are the EGFR levels expressed in the various lines uh, used in this experiment. And uh, this suppression of invasion is also seen at lower levels of uh, EGF concentration. This is surprising because uh, there are a number of studies that have shown that EGF can uh, uh, promote invasion in glioma cells. Uh, next, we overexpress the EGFR uh, and looked at the effect of, of on invasion. And we find that if you just overexpress the EGFR, transfect the EGFR in this GBM12 cells, then invasion is increased. However, if you now add EGF, again, you have the suppression of uh, invasion that was seen in the original cell line. So whether uh, in, both, in both circumstances, EGF suppresses invasion. Uh, this is also true in a second cell line that does not express endogenous EGFR. So then we ask the question, okay, how does ligand activated EGFR signaling suppress invasion? Uh, and we looked at a previous study uh, that looked at the gene expression profiles of glioma cells with or without EGF. And we found that this protein uh, called BIN3 was our top hit. Uh, and it's induced only by ligand-activated EGFR signaling. Uh, BIN3 is a, a member of the bar domain family of uh, uh, proteins, and bar domains are known to be involved in regulation of cell motility and interact with small GTPases, which have a critical role in GBM innovation. We first confirmed that EGF does actually induce uh, in three expression in various PDX lines and find that uh, yes, it does. Now, this was an important experiment where if we do siRNA knockdown of uh, BIN3, then EGF is no longer able to suppress invasion. Okay, this is found in two different PDX lines shown here. 
uh, and suggest that BIN3 is required for ETF-mediated suppression of invasion. On the other hand, if you overexpress BIN3 and PDX lines, then you suppress invasion. And next, uh, we wanted to examine the biological effects of ETF on invasion in a mouse model. Uh, and uh, we start by expressing TGF alpha and Mayo PDX line to, gen to generate an autocrine loop in which uh, both the receptor and ligand are expressed by the same tumor. And what we found is that mice with TGF-alpha overexpressing tumors had a better survival rate compared to vector transfected tumors. You can see here that TGF-alpha is overexpressed in these tumor cells. And uh, the mice with intracranial tumors, such GBM12 TGF-alpha, live, live longer, uh, have smaller tumors. And here, what we're looking at is the effect on invasion. So you can see a relatively clear boundary between normal uh, tissue and tumor in the GBM12 TGF alpha tumors, whereas uh, the, the tumor cells and the normal tissue uh, is completely dispersed uh, in the absence of added ligand. Uh, here we have done a mouse neurofilament stain, and again, you see the very clear border uh, and reduced invasion uh, in the GBM12 TGF alpha tumors. Uh, on the other hand, when we look at proliferation, proliferation is increased uh, in GBM12 TGF alpha uh, tumors, as would be expected. So constitutive EGFR signaling promotes invasion, larger tumors, and a worse prognosis, whereas ligand-activated EGFR signaling results in smaller, non-invasive, hyperproliferating tumors and improved prognosis. Uh, next, we looked at the effect of directly infusing EGF uh, in uh, the mouse brain uh, harboring intracranial tumors. And you can see that there's a large tumor in the controlled uh, PBS infusion. But uh, with EGF intrusion, the tumor is really much smaller. Uh, next, we asked whether it would be possible or whether we could identify a drug that could upregulate Ventri that could be potentially very useful. Uh, in the treatment of glioblastoma. And we identified a drug in a drug screen uh, uh, called tofastinib, which is a JAK inhibitor. It's also known as Zeljans and uh, uh, is used for the treatment of arthritis. And uh, we found that tofastinib does actually upregulate BIN3 in multiple PDX lines. And importantly, tofastinib mm -hmm. suppresses invasion in uh, transwell uh, invasion assays. Importantly, tofastinib also suppresses tumor growth and invasion in orthotopic models, uh, as we found for the infusion of EGF or EGFR ligands. Um, then to answer the question of how does tofastinib suppress invasion or upregulate BEN3, we found that um, tofastinib actually activates the EGFR. So in 24 hours, you can see that phosphorylation of the EGFR has increased in various lines. Now, this activation of EGFR can be suppressed by cetuximab, which blocks ligand binding to the EGF. And here, what we also found is that uh, tofastinib upregulates the EGFR ligand HBEGF. So these data suggest that tofastinib induces a ligand dependent activation of EGFR. So next we come to the question uh, that is EGFR signaling uniformly oncogenic? It has been assumed. I mean, the EGFR is a prime oncogene 
uh, and has attracted a lot of attention and investigation. Uh, so we looked at TCGA data, and what we found is that there are seven EGFR ligands, seven known EGFR ligands, and these ligands are expressed in glioblastoma, the highest being HBGF. So next we looked, we subdivided uh, GBMs into high EGFR, high ligand, uh, or low, low EGFR, high ligand, and various groups. So we came up with four groups. We have EGFR copies less than four. This is EGFR non-amplified and ligand score less than median. So this is a combined score of all seven ligands. Then we have EGFR copies less than four, ligand score greater than median. So low receptor, high ligand. And here we have EGFR copies greater than four, so EGFR amplified with low ligands. And then you have EGFR copies greater than four and high ligands. This is the group that you would expect to have the worst prognosis, but in fact, this turns out not to be true. So if we look at the prognosis of EGFR low EGFR, less than four copies, and high EGFR ligand. This is a highly oncogenic combination. Uh, but when you look at EGFR copies high, greater than four, and the ligand score is also high, there's a complete reversal from the oncogenic effect to now there is a tumor suppressive effect that is statistically significant. So this is a surprising result. Uh, we also found, this is also another surprising result, is that high phospho EGFR actually confers a better prognosis, and the high phospho EGFR may be from uh, the effect of ligands or activating mutations, uh, but seems to confer uh, an improved prognosis. So we would say that the EGFR ligand shifts the role of EGFR from oncogene to tumor suppressor in EGFR amplified GBM. Uh, low EGFR plus low ligand leads to better prognosis. Low EGFR plus high ligand, this has the worst prognosis. High EGFR plus low ligand also has a bad prognosis, but a high EGFR plus high ligand is a better prognosis this is the unexpected result from our TCG analysis, but one that strongly validates our experimental findings, showing that ligand activation of EGFR results in small tumors that fail to invade and leads to a better prognosis in mouse models. So our conclusions here would be that uh, although both unrestrained uh, proliferation and invasion are hallmarks of cancer, in GBM, invasion is required for tumor expansion. We identify BIN3, the cytoskeletal protein BIN3, as a critical negative regulator of invasiveness. And uh, importantly, perhaps for uh, patients, the tumor suppressive function of EGFR can be therapeutically activated by using tofacinib to suppress GBM invasion. So if we are to target the EGFR and GBM, we would say that uh, not all patients should be treated with EGFR inhibition. So we think that EGFR inhibition would be most effective in this group, this subgroup, which is EGFR non-amplified with high ligand. And here we could use an EGFR inhibitor plus a, a blocker of the accompanying adip, adaptive response such as thalidomide. Uh, if the EGFR is non-amplified and there's no ligand, uh, we don't think it makes sense to target the EGFR. Now, this group, which would probably seem like the best candidate for EGFR inhibition, should also not be treated with EGFR inhibition because a combination of high ligand and high EGFR is actually uh, a tumor suppressive. Uh, this subgroup, we think EGFR amplified with low ligand could be treated with tofacinib or also possibly with uh, an EGFR inhibitor. So we think that uh, one reason why so many trials of uh, 
uh, EGFR inhibition and glioblastoma had failed may have been because of inappropriate uh, patient selection. This work has uh, now been published. Uh, and if you uh, want to get, get more details about the work I've described, uh, uh, this paper came out in August uh, 2022. And uh, we are also starting a clinical trial of trifosinib in recurrent GBN patients at UT Southwestern with Dr. Mark Yusuf as the principal investigator. Uh, and I would like to end by uh, thanking the first author of this study, Gao, uh, who did most of the experimental work and really made a massive uh, contribution to the study. Uh, I would like to uh, stop by thanking you, uh, to end by thanking you for your attention. Um, goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Habib. Our next speaker is Dr. Farhan uh, Mirza. Uh, Dr. Mirza is Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery and Director of Epilepsy Surgery at the University of Kentucky, very close to Tennessee, I might add. Uh, after graduating from AKU, he completed his neurosurgery residency there at the University of Kentucky. He then did a fellowship in epilepsy surgery as well as brain tumors at the renowned Montreal Neurological Institute, the MMI, and McGill University. And he was uh, as well uh, a visiting fellow in pediatric epilepsy surgery at Great Ormond Street Hospital for children in London. He's very interested in enhancing the availability of epilepsy surgery for patients who have medically intractable epilepsy. Well, uh, also has a keen interest in awake uh, intracranial procedures, especially operating in uh, close proximity to uh, speech movement, uh, and other areas of the brain with higher cognitive processing functions. So welcome, Dr. Musser. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, for, for this kind introduction. Uh, we're only three hours away from you and uh, might be in, in Nashville in December uh, for the American Epilepsy Society meeting. So might swing by to say hello in person. Uh, I really would like to thank uh, all my mentors and colleagues, especially Dr. Atharanam, Dr. Shazad Shamin, and Dr. Noreen Mashtaq for this kind invitation. And, and, uh, and assalamu alaikum and hello to a bunch of friends and, and uh, close uh, colleagues at AKU. I don't see anybody in the auditorium, but I'm assuming some of, uh, uh, some of them are present. So uh, without further ado, we'll get started. Uh, I will disclose that I did not speak with Dr. Rahil Ahmed before this. And you'll see a lot of similarities between uh, his and my presentation, but hopefully repetition will help and uh, maybe some new ideas um, that I can, I can impart to you as well. So we'll get started. Again, thanks to the organizers for this uh, brilliant symposium. I don't have any disclosures. Uh, the objectives of the presentation is to understand what long-term epilepsy-associated tumors are, what the definition is, and what uh, treatment strategy one can utilize to address uh, these tumors. So I, I always like to start with this slide that epilepsy is a team sport and uh, it requires a very large team of uh, uh, epileptologists, epilepsy surgeon, neuroradiologist, and uh, large ancillary staff, uh, including your EMU staff, research fellows, uh, who really work together to bring one patient uh, to a successful epilepsy surgery outcome. And without a team like this, you really cannot function um, or, or provide the best possible care to these very vulnerable patients. Um, University of Kentucky, uh, just as a definition of what a level four comprehensive epilepsy center is. So the North American Epilepsy Center uh, Accreditation Society um, uh, designates centers as, uh, as per their abilities to provide not only diagnostic, but also uh, therapeutic interventions. And level four is the highest um, designation that is provided by the NAAC. Uh, just talking about numbers very quickly, uh, epilepsy has a very large disease burden. Um, high income countries are much less compared to low and middle income countries. So um, places like Pakistan, India, uh, Southeast Asia, 
are probably one of the highest uh, prevalent regions for epilepsy. Uh, obviously, we don't have large scale uh, prevalence data or incidence data, uh, but in fact, uh, our group um, uh, together at AKU, um, a large group is working on, on this data uh, right now. Um, in the United States alone, about three and a half million people live with epilepsy and of those about 500,000 are children. The astounding uh, numbers um, are that approximately 30 to 40% of these 500,000 are potentially refractory, which is about 150,000 patients. And of those uh, who are refractory, only about 1,500 or so eventually make it to a level four center for any kind of pre-surgical evaluation. And just by disease burden and its impact, epilepsy is only second to asthma in terms of uh, healthcare utilization and um, impact on academic and health outcomes in children and young adults. Um, to revisit this, drug-resistant epilepsy is defined as a failure of adequate trials of two well-tolerated and appropriately chosen medications to achieve, achieve sustained seizure freedom. It's very important to identify uh, early identification of refractory epilepsy because it has a lot of um, uh, downstream consequences, which are not only limited to structural brain damage, but also um, systemic comorbidities, and uh, most importantly, the psychosocial stigma of not being able to drive, not being able to hold a job, not, um, not holding a, a uh, respectable place in society in some situations, unfortunately, especially in, in, in our part of the world. Uh, particularly in children, uh, brain development can be severely affected, uh, leading to increasing cognitive handicaps over time. So ongoing seizures, side effects from medications, again, social stigma. And again, this is worse in a resource-limited LMIC setting. Um, it's very important for us to take a, um, a few seconds to understand that anybody who has medically refractory epilepsy for whatever cause or reason the goal uh, of an epilepsy team is to get them to seizure freedom to improve their quality of life or at least reduction in seizure burden so that their and their caregivers' lives are improved. And if somebody is medically refractory, then they deserve to undergo a thorough evaluation to understand if there's anything beyond uh, medications that can be done uh, for a better treatment for them. We know that the best response to um, advanced intervention for epilepsy is often with any type of lesional or MRI positive epilepsy. And, and part of that is uh, tumor related epilepsy or long-term epilepsy associated tumors. Um, another um, way to think about these epileptogenic substrates is uh, developmental or vascular lesions, or again, uh, these LEATs, which we will talk about in a, in a few minutes. And what is important to understand is that best results are achieved with initial complete res uh, lesion and epileptogenic zone resection around the lesion. So take a step back, and especially for, for the trainees in the audience, when you're encountered with a patient with a uh, brain tumor, uh, the, the foremost incision that the neurosurgeon has to make is whether the tumor needs to be treated or not. And if it, is, if it does need to be treated, what is the safest approach or technique that should be utilized for that? And then based on pathology, you decide uh, further adjuvant treatment strategy. The way I, I would, um, uh, I would uh, implore you to think about uh, whenever you see a tumor patient is, is the tumor being uh, treated for pure oncologic control? Is the tumor being treated for a combination of oncologic and epilepsy control, or is a tumor, uh, the epilepti epileptogenic substrate and the surgery or the focus of treatment is performed purely for control of epilepsy. So pure oncologic control is generally for metastatic lesions, GBM, meningiomas, booster foster tumors in children, or any other primary brain tumor presenting with local mass effect, hydrocephalus, et cetera. And the strategy simply is to treat the tumor. Um, one caveat, which uh, will make more sense probably in the following slides, that when you have somebody with a grade two or suspected grade two or a low-grade astrocytoma, uh, 
early neurocognitive testing should be considered for baseline as these patients are expected to live for a long time. Uh, so strategy shouldn't simply be to just go on with treatment, but to, uh, to include some um, preoperative testing before proceeding towards surgical resection. So here's an example, large right frontal brain tumor um, underwent resection. Uh, gross total or near gross total resection is achieved. Um, patient does well, undergoes uh, adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation. Here's another example of a metastatic lesion uh, presenting with seizures. Patient undergoes resection, tumor is removed, patient does well, and then goes on to receive adjuvant chemo and radiation. Then you have the second kind of uh, or uh, second kind of tumors. Is the tumor being removed for a combination of oncologic and epilepsy control? So there is a pre-existing diagnosis of epilepsy, or there is at least a short history of uh, seizures, which led to the discovery of the tumor. And the tumor itself has a concerning radiographic appearance. And generally, these are grade two astrocytomas, low-grade gliomas, um, and sometimes some grade one uh, glioma. Uh, grade one tumors can also have a similar appearance. In these cases, the way I like to think about it is that basic workup should still include a video EEG if it's available in a timely manner to understand where these seizures might be coming from, uh, have baseline neurocognitive testing, and uh, in some situations, a functional MRI with uh, diffusion tensor imaging for fiber tractography can be uh, very useful. And then uh, in some situations, if the seizure burden is truly high or there's a long-standing seizure burden, then intracranial EEG or intraoperative ECOG can be used to guide the extended peritumor tissue resection. Now, some examples of these would be, uh, this is a young man presenting with seizures and then discovered to have this pan-hippocampal uh, right-sided uh, glioma. It has a concerning appearance because it, it is contrast-enhancing and involves the entire hippocampus. But with, it, with this being right uh, temporal lobe and uh, young age, and I don't have the flare images here, but there was flare disease extending into the temporal pole. Uh, we elected to proceed with a larger section for this. And patient seizures are well controlled, his disease is well controlled, uh, and he's, he's doing well. Then another example is this young lady who presented with almost two years of uh, medication-resistant seizures, finally had an MRI scan, which showed this uh, lesion, which is quite concerning. It's in the posterior basal uh, tempor temporal lobe, um, is, is next to the parapocampal gyrus, probably infiltrating the fusiform gyrus, and sits in close proximity to the hippocampus. Uh, so in this case, she underwent a basic workup, and given the concerning radiographic appearance of the lesion, we proceeded to resect uh, the tumor. Turned out to be a grade one uh, glioneuronal tumor with some uh, abnormal features, which um, uh, weren't quite classified by the pathologists. But she is doing well off medications, two years, seizure-free, and tumor is, is well-controlled without recurrence. So now we move on to uh, the third kind of tumors, um, the, the tumors that are potentially epileptogenic substrates and surgery is being performed purely for control of epilepsy. So there's a diagnosis of epilepsy longstanding and on MRI, there's a tumor or a lesion that has a benign radiographic appearance. So here's some examples. So this is a young man with this um, posterior parahippocampal uh, lesion, which is in close proximity to the tail of the hippocampus. And he has seizures, but they're well controlled on two medications and he's not, not experiencing any, any side effects. And the tumor is uh, unchanged on serial imaging. So we've continued to watch this. Another example of a rather benign looking uh, lesion in the left face motor area. Uh, patient has seizures. They're intractable, but on EEG, uh, we have no electrographic correlate for, for her seizures, so likely some non-epileptogenic uh, spells or uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Again, we're just continuing to watch this. Uh, some more examples of similar um, lesions which are associated with epilepsy but are well controlled in, in all of these patients. So you have this left amygdala lesion, another left amygdala lesion, an anterior cingulate lesion, 
a right amygdala lesion. All the, all these patients, their seizures are well controlled, and we have not operated on their uh, on these tumors. Now here are some more examples. So here's a young boy with a really benign looking cystic lesion in the right fusiform gyrus. Um, gets on one medication, has side effects from that. Gets on a second medication procedures, continues to have side effects. Seizures are still well controlled, but significant side effects. So after discussion uh, and undergoing uh, workup, uh, we proceeded to resect and um, small opening, small incision, resection is completed. Patient is now doing well. He's almost a year out from surgery and he has been able to wean himself off of uh, medication. Another example of an LEAT, uh, an amygdala lesion, left amygdala, uh, same story with seizures, underwent resection is almost two and a half years out. A young boy with this very benign cystic looking lesion, but on further attention to the MRI, you can see this uh, transmental sign or this tail of uh, abnormal cells that trails down to the ventricular ependema, which makes this a focal, or at least uh, tells us that this could be a focal cortical dysplasia. And this, this boy undergoes resection uh, with intraoperative electrocorticography with extended margin resection. And uh, parents' observations at uh, about three months after surgery that he's in, uh, in the honors list in school where previously he was um, labeled as ADHD and in special uh, school. And mother's words, it's as if his brain has woken up and now he is taking in all the details of the world around him. So long-term epilepsy associated tumors, after we have seen all those examples, this definition encompasses lesions identified in patients who are investigated for long histories of drug-resistant epilepsy. They're generally slow-growing, low-grade, cortically-based tumors, and more often uh, they are seen in younger age groups, uh, children, adolescents, young adults. And they often appear to have a temporal lobe predominance. Uh, Ganglioglioma's and DNets are uh, probably the most common. And they are now grouped with uh, focal cortical dysplasia type 3b in, in the new classification of FCDs. And, and they are further united with these FCDs by some of the structural uh, similarities they have with FCDs and the adjacent cortex. Uh, in most cases, surgical treatment is beneficial uh, for these. And these are some examples of glioneuronal tumors, glial tumors that are designated as, or could be designated as long-term epilepsy associated tumors. So as Dr. Rahil Ahmed mentioned in his talk, the epileptogenesis is uh, largely tumor related factors. So they're intrinsically epileptogenic because of the presence of abnormal neurons within uh, the, the tumor. But then they also have a peritumoral uh, effect on the surrounding cortex uh, leading to epileptogenesis. And sometimes they can be associated with uh, hippocampal sclerosis or focal cortical dysplasias. The important thing to understand in this, in my opinion, is in younger children, uh, earlier onset of epilepsy with a lesion like this uh, can lead to um, establishment of wider network networks over time. So we see these lesions in young children who develop refractory epilepsy whereas we often sometimes see these in older adults who have never had seizures in their life and come in with the first seizure, and they really are nicely controlled on medication. So age has a, a strong correlation with establishing a wide network over time because of the plasticity of the brain. It's a developing brain. Connections are being formed. So epileptogenesis sort of hitchhikes onto those uh, forming connections. So workup for these uh, LEATs, in my opinion, should always start with some basic testing, which should involve video EEG, a high quality MRI read by an epilepsy radiologist, a PET scan to look at the hypo, uh, look at the metabolism of the brain, and neurocognitive testing. And then there's some secondary testing that can be performed uh, if the if the basic testing data is not enough. This is usually discussed in a refractory epilepsy conference setting where the slide that I showed you previously with all the team members, they're present and the data is discussed. If data is, is concordant, then a surgical option can be considered. Uh, 
but if you have discordant data, then you have to go to secondary testing or uh, intracranial EEG. Uh, this is a slide that I, I like to use, which um, I think covers all different kinds of surgical interventions that we perform for epilepsy. And you can see that most of the resective operations or ablations or focal resections are more on the curative side of the spectrum, whereas neuromodulation uh, is more on the palliative side. Uh, and palliative in this sense does not mean end of life, but uh, an improvement in quality of life. And then you have disconnection operations, which can be uh, curative depending on the underlying etiology. So it's and these are recent guidelines that um, were just published in, in March and then revised in June of uh, 2022, which specifically address the question of what to do with these uh, patients who have refractory epilepsy and long-term um, and lesions on MRI. And, and the, da the data is very clear that anybody who has a lesion, adult or child, even if they're seizure-free on one to two anti-seizure medications, they should be referred for at least an evaluation at an epilepsy center because the chance of them becoming refractory is, is quite high. We know that early intervention is effective, uh, surgical intervention is effective, especially in children uh, and select adults. And this can reduce the impact on the, on, on the healthcare system and on the families uh, by uh, significantly. So the question then becomes, should we wait until epilepsy becomes refractory to medical management or should we intervene early on these so-called lesional or lesion-associated epilepsies. In children, I think the data is clear that age is a predictor of outcomes. Earlier intervention on, on refractory patients or who uh, have a higher risk of becoming refractory has borne out to be beneficial. We know that long-term cognitive outcomes are, are worse with longer uh, duration of epilepsy just because the brain simply hasn't had a seizure-free time to develop normally. This is a very nice article published um, a, a, a few years ago in, in JNS, Journal of Neurosurgery, which showed that in these patients with focal epilepsies associated with long-term epilepsy-associated tumors, or LEATs, the outcomes are better in patients who underwent surgery before the age of 18, which lends some credence to the idea that the formation of these epileptogenic networks may be uh, very robust in, in children who have an early diagnosis of seizures and have an associated epileptogenic lesion. Again, uh, complete resection of the, of the lesion, a shorter duration of epilepsy, a younger age at time of surgery is, uh, has a, a significant impact on long-term outcomes. Surgery for these lesional uh, epilepsies can be successful even if you don't have focal EEG findings and if you'd rather have generalized EEG findings um, on, on your workup. So some, some myths to dispel about epilepsy surgery. Surgery is dangerous, that's, that's not true. Risks are as low as any similar operation such as a brain tumor. And refractory epilepsy should be considered as an electrical tumor, which if it can be removed safely, should be removed as early as possible. Medical therapy uh, is better than surgery. We know it's not true and it's proven in select patients. Healthcare costs are higher with surgery. Again, this is not true, but then uh, the question arises whether this applies to a low middle income country setting or not. Uh, waiting until the child is older is safer. That's not a true assessment is there. Then you're looking at potentially loss of one to two decades of potential seizure freedom and improved quality of life. And genetic causes or low IQ, again, is not a contraindication for, uh, for epilepsy surgery. Some misconceptions, which I, I, would, I would like to share with you, that patients and even physicians are often unaware that surgery is even an option for treatment. A general surgeon in February, 2020 asked me, wasn't this in vogue in the 70s? Uh, an internist in July 2021 asked me, oh, so is this a new treatment that wasn't available before? Then these are true statements from patients. Nobody had ever mentioned this to me before. 
or it was mentioned, but I was told I would lose my memory, my head would be shaved, I will not be able to see again, et cetera, et cetera. So all these misconceptions exist within the medical community and amongst patients as well. So uh, utilizing what available resources is very important. So referring to an epilepsy center where um, further investigations can occur for these uh, really very vulnerable patients is very important. Uh, to help improve their quality of life. And a referral to an epilepsy surgery center does not mean they're committed to undergo brain surgery, but it's rather to uh, utilize um, the, the advanced or higher level resources that might be available at that center. In an LMIC setting, the way I see it and in discussions with Dr. Anam, I think the most important things for us is to identify the disease burden, identify knowledge gaps and awareness of treatment options, and then capacity building where we have trained experts in the field, we have basic epilepsy testing available and medical and surgical treatment. Um, as, per, um, as, a, as a part of this effort, uh, one of, uh, one of uh, our projects is being presented by Dr. Bakshi, who's now an attending at AKU at the upcoming Congress of Neurological Surgeons, where the group studied awareness of epilepsy surgery in parents and guardians of children diagnosed with epilepsy in, in Pakistan. And, and this is uh, the group that has been working on some of these projects. So in the end, I, I'd like to summarize that goal uh, is the best, and goal of all of these efforts is to best treat refractory epilepsy and the mindset shouldn't be medication versus surgery or neuromodulation versus resection, rather what is the best option for an ind individual patient's epilepsy at that uh, time point. And for this, combination therapy is key, which includes medications, uh, diet, and surgical treatment. And we've already discussed benefits of early aggressive management and take-home points from an LEAT standpoint, long-term epilepsy-associated tumor standpoint, particularly for the trainees. When you see a patient with epilepsy and brain tumor, think what is your primary goal? Is it epilepsy control? Is it oncologic control? Or is it both? If it is not purely oncologic control, such as high grade uh, looking lesion on MRI, mass effect, neurological deficit, and control of epilepsy is desired, then a proper pre surgical workup should be considered before proceeding with surgery to avoid surgical failures in the form of recurrent seizures. In children, uh, particularly, LEATs should be considered for early removal for long term uh, seizure free outcomes. Um, Despite long natural history of LEATs, waiting is not uh, optimal uh, because it potentially precludes these uh, young children, young adults from a chance of complete cure and being off drug therapy and leading a possibly completely normal um, life afterwards. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention and thank you for the invitation to speak at, at the symposium. Thank you, Dr. Mirza, for your excellent talk. In the last, I would like to introduce my last speaker of the sessions, Dr. Isaac Khan. Dr. Isaac is currently working as an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics, Heber Medical University. In 2017, he established a research facility, Cancer Cell Culture and Precision on Co-Medicine Lab, and developed a biobank from the brain cancer patient and their primary cancer cell line. Moreover, he is working as a consultant for COVID-19 diagnostic and Sanger sequencing at Advanced Center for Genomic Technology and Public Health Reference Lab. He leads the research group Pakistan Neuro-Oncology Research Group, which is collaborates with renowned national and international scientists, neurosurgeons, histopathologists, and oncologists. Dr. Isaac is also a member of the Pakistan Society of Neuro-Oncology and a young investigator of the European Association for the Cancer Research since July 2018. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, first of all, I'm um, thankful to the uh, organizing committee of the third uh, uh, third annual near oncology symposium. And uh, my uh, sincere regards to Professor Adar Inam. Um, so today's um, uh, major focus of my talk is going to be on the uh, precision neuron comedicines and uh, 
the novel biomarker discoveries. So before getting into the, um, uh, into the major uh, core research, I'll just like quickly cover uh, the uh, current concepts of the medicines, which has a little bit improved with passage of time, but it's still 90% across the world being used, which is the one size fit all concept. So one size fit all concept is um, uh, the concept that, that's being employed in the, uh, in the medicines where cancer patients, for example, brain tumors patients, uh, they all are being treated with a specific type of therapeutics uh, that potentially shows a good prognostic outcome and therapeutic outcomes in a subtype of people. But in some people, it's not going to uh, show some effects or the effects are going to be low. And uh, in some patients, the effects actually uh, get worse. So it shows the adverse effects. Although the therapy is same, Patients are same, tumors are same, but because of the uh, the heterogeneity among different tumors and because of the variations in human populations. So for that purpose, as a result, the in the last decades, this um, uh, precision medicine field actually emerges, and uh, as a result, uh, the medicine is now looking into more of a personalized diagnostics rather than uh, one size fit all concept. So in this case, uh, cancer patients, like the brain tumors patients, they get they are being get tested for uh, specific biomarkers, which are either the genetics or epigenetics, and uh, as a result, a specific type of therapeutic options are then revised, and based on those therapeutic options, which is specific for those specific patients, the overall impact of that therapeutic uh, dosages. Uh, helps in improve therapeutic outcome with uh, successful prognostic outcomes. So precision medicine is more like um, a, a medical model for the customizations of healthcare uh, uh, that ultimately influence the medical decisions, the treatment options, and uh, uh, a way for the clinicians to use that approach as a practice and the products that are being tailored. So as a result, we are going to be seeing an improved uh, prognostic outcomes. Um, this indicates that as we move forward, what we are actually thinking or which, what we are actually seeing is uh, uh, the more critical aspects for the precision neuro-oncology is to get involved in enhanced or increased genomic and molecular testings of a uh, patient's tumor. And by doing so, it will actually improve our treatment choices because they are actually now based on the individualized uh, tumor mutational analysis. Um, currently at the US, uh, I've seen lots of groups who are working on a specific mutational profile of a patient. And then based on that mutational profile, they uh, uh, go for a specific targeted therapeutic approach. So the majorly in, in the brain cancer, the mutations uh, that are being studied now or that are being, that are being utilized for the uh, precision neuro-oncology approach are including the variant of EGFRs, IDH1, NGM2, smoother, and AGT1, uh, and probably some more. And based on that, they are actually uh, uh, trying to devise uh, precisely uh, innovative therapies for a uh, specific type of brain tumors. And when we, once we are actually talking about the uh, therapeutic potentials in the precision neuro-oncology, the shift is moving towards the precision neuro-oncomedicine. Now, this precision neuro-oncomedicine neuro ultimately involve the most advanced type of therapies, which are the targeted therapies. So these targeted therapies are actually specific for specific targets in brain tumors. And those specific biomarkers has been reported or has been extensively studied that they are involved in wide range of um, uh, brain tumors aggressiveness, brain tumors resistance, brain tumors metastatic potentials. But seeing with like from one side, once when we are talking about the druggable targets in brain tumors, 
On the other side, uh, there is like new waves of uh, new biological information coming out. And I hope that we all uh, have read these uh, new dimensions in, uh, in, in cancer, which, which is the hallmarks of cancers uh, published by Professor Hanahan and Professor Weinberg. Um, so it was initially six, then it turns into uh, 10. And now it's 14, 14 hallmarks of cancer just published recently in December, 2021. And this means that initially, if you were thinking that there are only six hallmarks, which comes together, they play together and they make the cancer aggressive and make the cancer metastatic. Now we have 14 hallmarks of cancer and then each hallmarks of cancer actually possess lots of uh, uh, somewhere around like hundreds of different markers involved in, uh, in the underplay of uh, making the cancer aggressive, making the cancer resistant to therapeutic options, making the cancer metastatic. So based on these, we uh, there are different uh, technologies that are being employed for um, uh, novel biomarker discoveries and for novel uh, hit discoveries. Um, I have recently uh, published this thing, this is a chapter, and this was the figure that I draw uh, and I tried my best. Uh, it probably look uh, confusing, but if you just start from looking at these high throughput technologies, that, that is actually the major mean or the major, uh, major uh, platform for precision neuro-oncologies. So it involves the uh, involvement of high throughput technologies. And as a result, uh, of sequencing as a result of like, if we are talking about the whole exome sequencing, whole, whole genome sequencing or gene expression profiling, we are going to be generating uh, a big amount of data and that we call big data, but it's not just a single group across the world, there are hundreds of groups who are working on generating this big data. So a platforms has been established to, uh, to actually analyze that data and that they call the data mining. And as a result of that data mining, you end up with a specific target identifications. And then alongside some of the colleagues already have mentioned about the involvement of artificial intelligence, but there is this artificial intelligence majorly involved using some support factor machine learnings to identify those druggable targets from that huge data that's out there. And based on some integrated databases, you can actually identify a druggable targets. Now, once those targets are being identified, you move towards the discovery of specific biomarkers inhibitors. And that comes the chemoinformatics, which our uh, one side of the group uh, who's majorly expert in the drugs discovery are working on this aspects of, of uh, looking for novel uh, inhibitors for those novel markers. W once these are being computerly analyzed, they move to a biomarker validation. So in biomarker validation, the first step is always the in silico computer-based studies, where they look for the molecular interactions, uh, network analysis, they go for the molecular docking, that is ultimately followed by the uh, molecular dynamic simulations. Once uh, a biomarker has been validated in silico and a drug target has been identified, that moves to the in vitro studies. So, so you can test those drugs either on the cell lines or either on the patient-derived cell lines, and that ultimately followed by the uh, in vivo studies. So once that bi biomarker has been identified, it moves toward the biomarker development that gets into the pre clinical trials. So we now move from the preclinical trials into the clinical trials. So in the clinical trials, once the biomarker has been approved and the drug has been approved, it comes into the market but then the same drug is again being tested and being evaluated for further clinical correlations and for the further addition discoveries. And ultimately this cycle goes on. So um, when I was like, we, we, we talk about the uh, brain tumors uh, and uh, when I established this uh, uh, research group, Pakistani Iran College research group, um, the ultimate goal of this group was to actually establish a biobank uh, uh, and that biobank should possess uh, the patient-derived samples because it was necessary that the, uh, the most important aspect to mention here is that the commercial cell lines uh, 
which is available uh, uh, commercially. These are the cell lines which has been growing outside the patient's body for like nearly 30 years, 50 years. If we specifically talk about the molecular glioma cell lines, the UAT cell line, it's been growing like for nearly uh, 50 years. And uh, it's been generated in Sweden, uh, in Uppsala University. Uh, and the patient is like uh, no more, but her cells are growing. And uh, as a result, for 50 years of those cells being growing outside the human body, uh, those cells have actually established mutations which doesn't really exist, exist in the human original body or in, in, in that natural setups. So the biomarker discoveries or the novel mutational discoveries is probably going to mislead the uh, community. So that's why the patient-derived cell lines are the most important source to look or to, to study all the real uh, uh, genetic mutations or the epigenetic landscape of, of, of cancer patients, of specifically brain, can brain cancer patients. So we were actually generating different cell lines, but this was the third time when I came across with a, a cell line that we were generating uh, the female had a breast cancer uh, history, and she developed these uh, breast cancer brain metastases. Now, these cell lines were behaving totally different, and uh, uh, they were resistant to the therapeutic options that we were testing in our labs, and uh, they were showing resistant phenotypes. So, uh, uh, like we all know, this is the most basic concepts of the how, how does the brain metastasis develops. Moving forward, it was interesting to know that about 90% or more than 90% of deaths actually results because of these uh, uh, metastases. And when, when I looked into the uh, breast cancer brain metastasis, I, I got to know that uh, all of those breast cancer patients with her two positive phenotypes more than like 50% or like between 30 to 50 persons are going to develop the breast cancer brain metastasis. And uh, there are already US FDA approved drug for uh, targeted therapies for these breast cancer brain metastasis that includes the three uh, oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are the small molecule inhibitors being used as targeted therapies, uh, three monoclonal antibodies and two uh, ADCs. So, uh, and they have uh, been tested, they have been approved from the clinical trials as I showed the uh, cycles behind. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the prognostic outcomes are not uh, improved, are not severely improved or, or, or much improved as we expected. Um, so the uh, drugs discovery group of our uh, Institute, what they are doing exactly is that they have actually discovered some novel tyrosine kinase inhibitors for resistant breast cancer brain metastasis. And uh, uh, these are the first type of uh, small molecule inhibitors that has ever been reported. And uh, it's currently being uh, tested in, uh, extensively for uh, different aspects of it. So, just to get some preliminary data of that, um, when these uh, novel tyrosine kinase inhibitors that's being developed in our lab, they have shown uh, improved uh, selectivity for the HER2 and also in the uh, thymic neuromyces with the bt 4 c and 4 xenocrop These are the HER2 positive cell lines. Um, uh, it actually showed uh, enhanced activities and it greatly reduced the tumor's growth. But alongside it was important that alongside the HER2, VGFR is majorly involved in metastasis and as it's majorly involved in angiogenesis. So these anti-novel, uh, the, the novel anti-VGFR uh, inhibitors, they reveal promising VGFR inhibitions. And uh, when it was compared to the FDA approved serafinib. So we have uh, actually uh, shortlisted specific candidates, but the drug discovery group was saying that like, for cancer patients, it's like when a patient is already going through a complicated phases, uh, it cannot be exposed for repeated uh, drugs. So what they are now trying is to make a single drug 
that will help affinity to target kinase, HER2 and the relative kind target the kinase VGFR with the same target, with the same drug. Um, now, the interesting point here was to look for uh, an animal model where we can actually develop the uh, breast cancer brain metastasis. So our group has already worked on that and they have already developed a, a model, the breast cancer brain metastasis model, uh, where we are going to be testing the uh, novel inhibitors that has been uh, discovered recently in our, in our team. Um, our current work, the ongoing work includes uh, different aspects of it. Um, so I'm just uh, quickly uh, covering this aspect. We have recently uh, separated some grants. And um, uh, so now the major focus, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that we are going to be focusing on the patient derived uh, cell lines rather than the commercial cell lines. And we are going to be developing a xenograph model from uh, patients derived cell lines. We already have tested some uh, uh, on all drugs against the different mutations because the existing drugs, the FDA approved small molecule inhibitors, they have been uh, shown some tremendous uh, outcomes, but uh, because of the mutations that's being reported in HER2 in all the druggable targets, those mutations actually results in bypassing, uh, bypassing the uh, approved uh, small molecule inhibitors. So as a result, uh, our drugs, our novel compounds show that they are actually also covering those mutations, uh, which, is, which shows that they are uh, more advanced to the uh, currently approved uh, small molecule inhibitors. And we, they have been like extensively tested using different uh, transfer migration assays, invasion assays, wound healing assays. In addition to that, we are already, uh, uh, like as I said, uh, once you are testing one drug specific, it's going to be changing the gene expression profile of different other genes. And that's what we actually found. We found that there is some novel genes which arises because of targeting a specific markers in, in, in the cancer pathway. And more interestingly, the markers which were shifting or which were majorly involved in that resistance were the EMT markers. So all the EMT associated cancer stem cells markers were found to be majorly involved in developing post-treatment resistance, which is one of the most complicated aspects of cancer research and for the novel cancer drugs discovery in recent times. So we found those uh, EMT associated cancer stem cells marker. In addition to that, we are also profiling the microRNAs. So these microRNAs are actually uh, being found to have correlations with the cancer stem cells. Ultimately, we have so far uh, 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 we have so far received some advancement in uh, overcoming the resistance and in overcoming the uh, improved uh, specificity for, for that specific druggable targets. And these drugs have actually bypassed the blood-brain barrier and uh, they are currently being developed. So we are now looking for some novel discoveries of uh, targeting those novel genes, the EMT markers in the same run, and also uh, trying to uh, probably knock out some microRNAs. Now, all of these approaches are being currently uh, employed and uh, they are actually resulting into uh, pushing us more into looking for uh, single cell sequencing and spatial transcriptomics. Uh, the reasons for that is that all these tumors are heterogeneous. Uh, we know that thing. And we know that once we devise the uh, drugs, uh, once we actually devise or discover some novel uh, uh, druggable targets, those targets are being uh, discovered or being uh, developed from the complex or for the mixture of all that genome. But what's happening at the single cell level, that is the more important aspects. So for that thing, we are currently uh, dividing the tumors for uh, spatial transcriptomics. So spatial transcriptomics actually tells you the real-time gene expression of specific uh, specific genes involved in the aggressiveness involved in the uh, 
resistance and involved in the uh, metastasis. And also the single RNA sequencing is going to separate us the populations of different cells based on their expression profile. And this will ultimately help us in translating these observations from animal models into the clinical trials. And it will also help us in the clonal expansion and understanding the cellular plasticity of uh, brain tumors, which will ultimately help us in developing uh, the uh, improved uh, clinical therapeutic outcomes. We already have, uh, uh, so this, this is one of the uh, previous published studies in Cancer Center International. We have uh, found these pathways inside the brain tumors. Uh, uh, in meningiomas, this study was specifically conducted for meningiomas. Now we have found those the same uh, to, uh, EMT associated cancer stem cells markers associations in the breast cancer brain metastasis. So this indicates that these are actually the future targets. And uh, we have already identified some, some in the brain, some in the breast. So now we are currently majorly focusing on the CD133 and the CD44 as the EMT associated uh, cancer stem cells markers alongside the uh, notch one. So uh, that's it from my side. If any questions, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, well, can I just say for a moment how, how wonderful the talks have been in the entire meeting? Uh, just spectacular uh, speakers who've really, I think, uh, helped clarify a number of topics very uh, in a very sort of clear way. And that's true of the speakers in this uh, session. Um, uh, I think I've personally learned a, a lot and in, in, in the sessions helped me focus on a couple of concepts. One, just pipeline development for new uh, drugs, identifying um, uh, cancer specific uh, pathways, uh, focus on EGFR, thinking about it in very patient specific ways. And also, you know, take a step back and reflect for a moment about how uh, we've heard precision uh, neuro-oncology talks related to um, epilepsy surgery and brain tumors and how we really need to be thinking about how uh, patients are very individual. So it's, it's precision medicine from a surgical perspective. So um, questions, why don't we open it up to the audience for questions? Hope there are many. Uh, thank you. Uh, this one is uh, directed for Dr. Han. Uh, my name is Hamza. I'm a neurosurgery resident here at Ahan. Uh, does your lab have any uh, recent work in, in, the, uh, in characterizing the epigenome particularly and uh, any sort of targets for the epigenome particularly for gliomas or any sort of high-grade lesions? Yeah, uh, well, uh, thank you for that question. That, this is actually uh, one of the aspects that our lab here in the U.S. is now uh, diverting or focus on because uh, looking for what's happening with the uh, small molecule inhibitors targeting, and as a result, the uh, resistance being developed, uh, there is this major role that's being uh, played by the epigenetics. So uh, epigenetics is like, specifically, if you talk about the microRNAs, that's one of the aspects that we are touching. But in addition to that, we are also focusing on uh, methylation profiling and looking for the sequencing of uh, uh, methylome. So that's going to be helping us in discovering some novel targets, but we currently in the phase of uh, looking for those markers, we have not yet established, but there are some published markers already available. Um, thank you. Um, I also have a question for Dr. Mirza. Um, my question is that uh, literature seems to imply that a post-surgery three month EEG seems to be predictive for long-term seizure freedom. Um, so how long would we follow these patients with EEGs? Thank you, Uswan. Uh, nice question. So a uh, couple of, uh, couple of uh, things to think of. So all these patients are a long-term follow-ups. My plan is to follow these patients for life. So I see them at their three week post-op visit, then three months, then six months, then a year, and then every year from thereafter. Uh, we do usually do a post-op EEG at six months unless they have a recurrence of seizures and then we do it sooner. And the six-month EEG is to give us an idea whether we can start weaning their medication and if we can do that in a safe manner. 
uh, and that's been um, not a standard protocol for us, but uh, somewhat of a, a recurring practice for us that we do it at six months and then we start weaning medication between six months to a year. But we don't usually do routine EEGs on them uh, thereafter if they're seizure free. There's also a driver, driver's license or the ability to drive here is dependent on, on being seizure free for at least three months and it varies state to state. So that may be another reason why an EEG might be repeated. Dr. Ahmed, can you please answer the same question? Uh, the same. Uh, we usually wait till 12 months. Uh, if you have a young child who's been on three or four medications, then we might start taking the last added medications, the last one in first one out, because usually they're the least efficacious. And um, especially with uh, some of the more refractory kinds of very young children, um, you, you, you would try and remove maybe the fourth or the third medication, um, but we usually get a clean EEG usually around a year um, before we before we start meeting meds. Other questions? Um, I have another question. Um, so, um, in the talk, you mentioned that duration of epilepsy was strongly associated with uh, long-term seizure freedom. So, is there some cutoff after which you would say that the duration is so long that the likelihood of seizure freedom post-surgery is low and therefore surgery would not be the best option? Um, that usually depends on... Uh what the localization hypothesis and how the phase one evaluation, which is non-invasive workup adds up. Um, similar to your comment is uh, the issue that we face uh, that all adult epilepsy is pediatric epilepsy that wasn't treated well. So yes, you certainly wait long enough that it's gonna be um, um, widespread enough of a circuit that's probably not amenable to resection. But as long as uh, you can define a focal localization hypothesis that's consistent and concordant, um, then you're okay. We unfortunately see the converse problem in very young children too, um, who have widespread lesions, bilateral disease, um, so, and, 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 and those uh, may progress to uh, basically uh, unresectable state very early on. So it's not necessarily defined in terms of days and weeks and months, uh, but more on the nature and the rate of progression in disease. I have a question for the two uh, brilliant epilepsy surgeons. As a tumor surgeon, uh, when we're faced with, uh, let's say in particular grade one tumors, medial temporal lobe, for example, DNED or ganglioglioma, that type of thing, um, you know, the intraoperative decision-making about, you know, whether you take out the tumor per se, or whether you do, uh, as you say, lesionectomy plus is, uh, is always fraught. And I'm curious to know uh, what your, generally your thought process there in certain terms of the decision-making. For example, if you're, mo if you're measuring uh, with ECOG uh, and you still see activity after you've taken out the tumor, uh, can you ignore that, or should you? Can, is it always mandatory? Do you think to go uh, further? And how do you think about that? Um, it's as I often like to complain in almost every uh, epilepsy surgery. It's really hard to define the lesion, unlike as if you are removing a meningioma or a high grade lesion. So it's it's extremely important to have an a priori hypothesis before you go in in terms of either having anatomical um, uh, resection limits or electrophysiological uh, resection limits, um, especially if you've done a, a stereo EEG study or a subdural grid before, uh, where the limits of resection are defined by you know, negative landmarks uh, based on depth electrodes. Um, chasing uh, ECOG spikes is uh, a dicey slippery slope 
um, especially because um, sometimes, and especially cortical dysplasia, you could uh, have really an extended area uh, above and beyond the lesion where you may continue to capture spikes um, that may not necessarily equate with seizure freedom. Um, so if, if it's in a non-eloquent area, let's say the right frontal area, you could certainly go back as far as where you meet motor uh, function and, and remove it. Um, in other cases, usually you have to stop and, and, and potentially address it if the patient experiences a failure. Um, but it's, 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 it's really important to start the surgery with, uh, with, with a clear plan in mind. Um, otherwise, at least in my experience, it, it, it ends up being uh, a very difficult intraoperative decision. Um, ECOG is very susceptible to uh, the, um, the anesthetic protocol too, especially if you're doing both neurophysiological motor mapping, um, propofol suppressors, uh, it's helpful for motor mapping, but not the other way around. Um, so it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult to go in uh, with a clear surgical plan if you're solely relying on ECOG. Um, it's, um, it, 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 you, you have to be prepared to have a plan B, so as to say, in terms of where you will stop resection if ECOG doesn't work out. That's kind of a long-winded answer to your question. What about you, Farah? Uh, it's very similar to what Dr. Ahmed just said. Uh, a few things. So I use ECOG very sparingly, um, maybe once or twice a year. Uh, anesthetic has an effect on it. Um, uh, you don't capture seizures. You're only capturing interictal activity, which may or may not mean anything. It adds length to the operation. Risk of infection goes up. So if we ever have a question and we're unsure uh, of the seizure onset zone, or we're worried that the seizure focus may be beyond the lesion, or if we have to decide whether to remove hippocampus or not, along with an amygdala lesion, my preference always is to go with a stereo EEG first, do extraoperative seizure mapping in a very controlled setting, get uh, de novo seizures, uh, which are typical, confirm with stimulation at bedside, and then come back six to eight weeks later, or even sometimes in the same setting uh, with uh, the electrodes as a guide for resection. So, so my preference is always that. Uh, taking another step back, uh, even before that, we try to exhaust all non-invasive measures to identify seizure onset and so on. So functional imaging with PET, ictal spect, magnetoencephalography if, if it is necessary. So we try to do all of that and then stereo EEG. And ECOG, um, I, I remember maybe three cases of very surface focal cortical dysplasia that I used it for. Thank you, that's really thoughtful. And I think you guys are gonna have to help your tumor colleagues understand that. You know, I, I'm thinking back on cases where I felt, you know, giving uh, high fives about resecting the tumor uh, in a patient who presented with seizures, and then you know, three months later, they're having persistent seizures, and and really maybe thinking, taking a step back before you just plan the operation as to what 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 your goals are, and perhaps involving our epilepsy colleagues early on in these tumor resections would be helpful. It's super uh, thoughtful. So thank you. I think one comment I would add to that, Dr. Thompson, for low grades and maybe even for GBMs presenting with seizures. A, a supramarginal strategy might be of use, even if you're not using uh, all these fancy epilepsy tests up front. Uh, a sulcus to sulcus beyond the margins of your uh, tumor, the radiographic tumor or flare, uh, I think that is extremely useful in controlling seizures, especially in grade two astrocytomas. Thank you. Other thoughts, questions? Some back here. Assalamu uh, My name is Avaz. I am a medical student at Khyber Medical College. Uh, my question is directed to uh, Dr. Isaac. Uh, so you said that you are developing drugs which could target multiple, uh, a single drug that could target multiple pathways. So could uh, do you think that uh, repurposing uh, different drugs, a combination of different drugs for uh, brain metastasis could work? like a drug for, for uh, kidney neoplasm or, or any other colorectal neoplasm, and then com combining them uh, can work for uh, brain mets? Yeah, uh, 
so it, it's a good question is actually um, uh, like even me myself wasn't aware of this concept that because we're not from the uh, drugs drugs discovery uh, background so uh, but having different drugs uh, for different targets is uh, complicating the uh, already disturbed uh, patient's body so uh, that's why the major aspects in the drugs discovery is to focus on a single inhibitor that can inhibit multiple targets. So instead of testing uh, or in instead of giving the cocktail therapies, uh, which is uh, mostly being uh, used in clinics for the patients, uh, now the major focus is being diverted toward the single inhibitor that can target multiple uh, biomarkers. I think we are done with all the questions. Thank you. I will like thank all the speakers for their wonderful talks. And this was a really informative session. I hope everybody like uh, enjoy it and get the more information from these uh, highly educated session. So I would like to thank all of you for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adiba. Thank you, Dr. Thompson.